All right, so time to wrap up this lecture so that we can start fresh on Friday with tyrannosaurs and their kin. So we were looking in class at the earlier branches, the more basal branches within theropods, within carnivorous dinosaurs. So we saw coelophysoids, this group of gracile forms at the base. We saw this phase of more heavily built dilophosaur groups um, that evolved essentially into the avarostrans. Within avarostrans, we saw this two-way split. One, producing the di diverse types of ceratosaurs, so things like um, ceratosaurus and the noosaurs, some of which evolved away from carnivory, uh, and the abelisaurids, the stump-armed, short-snouted predators of the late Cretaceous of the southern continents. And then we moved over to the tetanurines, the stiff-tailed dinosaurs, early branches of which included the megalosauroids, so the sort of very generic-looking megalosaurids and piatnitsky saurids and so forth, and to where we are right now, the spinosaurids. So in spinosaurids, as we saw, the snout got very long, we have these conical teeth, and as I finished talking about in these forms, to some degree or other, there's elongated neural spines. The neural spines are really stretched out. So we saw this evolved in other groups of dinosaurs. We saw the Robachisaurids, where in Robachisaurus itself, it's got very tall neural spines. We saw very tall neural spines in Dicreosaurids, another sort of diplodocid, or diplodocoid, rather. We saw Uranosaurus, the um, um, uh, Cyracosternin, a type of ornithopod with very tall neural spines. Interestingly, Robachisaurus and other Robachisaurids um, and Spinosaurids and Uranosaurus overlap in time and place. They're sort of the equatorial regions during the mid part of the Cretaceous. We'll talk later on about one possible aspect for this convergence, but that may have something to do with the environment. But for now, just know this is a Spinosaurid trait. Now, Spinosaurus itself is the most famous one. Oh, I'm sorry these names aren't in white. I thought they were in white. Um, so, but we've got others of them. We have things like Irritator, which is known only from the back half of the skull, but for that back half of the skull is pretty well preserved. We have Baryonyx from the UK, Suchomimus from Niger, um, Ichthyovenator uh, from Southeast Asia, from Laos, um, and others from around the world. But intriguingly, none from North America, and we don't know why. North America had the right sort of food for Spinosaurids. It had the right sort of habitat. But at present, no one has found spinosaurid bones or teeth, which would be distinctive uh, in places of the right age at the right time for there to be spinosaurids. And these include places like Utah and Oklahoma and Colorado and Wyoming and Maryland, because the fossils from the mid Cretaceous of Maryland are the right opportunity, the right environment, the right food sources for spinosaurids. And yet, so far, no sign. We don't know why. So why, sort of the old joke, why the long face? Um, yeah, why the long face? Fish eating. Almost certainly that's the major adaptation going on here. So this is not a complete Spinosaurus skull. It is a composite. But it shows us what we see in, in Spinosaurids, and that is the snout is quite long. The nerus is over here. So it's way retracted back. You know, the nerus is you know up forward. In a lot of other um, theropods, it's way back here. And unlike the situation in sauropodomorphs and so forth, the nostril is probably right up here. It's not way down here. So that's the orbit way up here. Nerus here, conical teeth, and these very long crocodile-like snouts. Almost certainly, these are adaptations for catching fish. And if you think about it, that is the diet of many crocodilians, particularly with these sort of snouts. Now, to be fair, big crocodilians also eat land vertebrates and spinosaurids. We've got good evidence of them eating land vertebrates. Um, for instance, in the type specimen of Baryonyx are both the digested remains of fish scales, but also the digested remains of a small iguanodon. If you look at the tooth of a spinosaurid, it is a very close match for a crocodilian tooth. So it's good for stabbing, holding in, and piercing. Not so much slashing, 
or slicing, but piercing and holding. And so many of us have considered spinosaurids to be kind of like uh, crocodilians in their diet. That is, including a lot of fish, but also the occasional land vertebrates. And that at least most spinosaurids uh, were probably wading out into the water, perhaps dipping their snout into the water, waiting for fish to come by, grabbing onto it and hauling it out. Sort of like a heron, uh, but also kind of like a, um, a grizzly bear. However, there is some evidence that spinosaurids may have been actually better swimmers than most other big carnivorous dinosaurs. So it's intriguing that all the spinosaurids found so far have been found in environments where we know that there are absolutely some large fish and other aquatic food that's available. They tend to be from swamps and bayous and, and so mangrove environments. So Spinosaurus itself, the last one of the last and certainly the largest known one, you see a human scuba diver for scale, coincides with a lot of very big fish and even a dwarf uh, plesiosaur in the same environment, as well as some turtles. Now, no one has yet found a complete Spinosaurus skeleton. So we've got composite material of different individuals that people have tied together, but one of the big questions is the relative proportions of the different spots. So for instance, in this restoration, the arms are almost assuredly way too big. On the other hand, the hind limbs are definitely this short compared to the body, because the stuff in red is from one individual. Um, and so those are weird proportions for a theropod, especially for as big a theropod as Spinosaurus is. Additionally, those complete Spinosaurus legs were, when discovered, showed that the bone wall, so the bone wall of the tibia, which was the better preserved part, is extremely thick in most theropods, including early Spinosaurids like Suchomimus and Baryonyx, there's a big open cavity in the middle. So here's Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, here's Suchomimus, here's a kiwi bird, so a flightless modern bird. A thickened bone wall, however, is found in some aquatic animals. It's found in things like manatees, it's also found in penguins. And so this was thought to potentially be evidence that Spinosaur us proper, not just Spinosaurids, but Spinosaurus, was a water-adapted dinosaur that is primarily a swimming dinosaur. And so since 2014, this has become a, but not the only, sort of paradigm of Spinosaurus spending most of its time in the water. It's fair to note that the amount of leg muscles in Spinosaurus relative as a proportion to its body mass was quite small, even compared to early Spinosaurids like Baryonyx, well actually this is Suchomimus, um, and um, much smaller than typical carnivorous dinosaurs like Coelophysis or Allosaurus, who we'll get to in a little bit, and definitely not as much leg muscles as in the speed specialists that we will encounter in the lecture on Friday, Ornithomimosaurs and Tyrannosaurs. So definitely Spinosaurus proper had reduced striding ability. However, it's not especially well built for floating, especially if you compare it to something like a penguin or an alligator. So it's not much better at floating around than other types of theropods. So it may not have been that much of a swimming specialist. Oh, but wait, you might say. I've heard how when we discovered the Spinosaurus tail more recently, it showed that it had a big tail fin. It's certainly true that it did. So here's the specimen with the various researchers studying it. Here's a restoration of it. So the tail does have this big sail on it, just like the back does. And indeed, in the initial paper on this that came out last year, the propulsive ability of this tail was compared to living crocodilians and the crested newt, and also to terrestrial carnivorous dinosaurs, terrestrial theropods, who we think have no real particular swimming ability, like Allosaurus and Coelophysis. And Spinosaurus sort of was partway in between the two. Okay, I would agree. Spinosaurus almost cer certainly was a better swimmer than Allosaurus and Coelophysis, and probably spent a lot of its time in the water. However, early this year, I and my colleague Dave Hone um, 
pointed out some problems with the idea of Spinosaurus being in, it, in the water all the time, or at least some of the claims of adaptations that were claimed to be in the water all the time. For instance, people said, well, that Neris is re retracted way back on the skull, so maybe it could snorkel. The problem is, although it's far back posteriorly, it is not far up dorsally. So it can't really use it like a blowhole on a whale or on a crocodile or on a, uh, uh, a hippopotamus, where the Neris is actually raised up above the rest of the skull, or at least above much, most of it. So, you know, it could maybe stick its head up, but it wouldn't be able to look around in order to breathe. Or it could go there, but most of the top of the head and indeed the back would be present. And instead, we suggest that the old model of them dipping their snouts in the water is more consistent with this pe presence of this nearest way back there. And that way they can continue to breathe while their snout is in the water waiting to catch food. And indeed, we feel... and we think we've shown, uh, that the position of the Neris is more similar to storks and herons, which feed with their snouts in the water, but their Neris and head above the water, than it is like crocodilians, where the Neris is just as high as the orbits, because that way they could breathe and look around, but have not any of the rest of the body showing above the water line. Additionally, uh, we'd like to point out that the newt tail that was compared to um, to Spinosaurus and suggested it was for swimming, that newt doesn't actually use its tail for swimming. It's a display structure. And in fact, only the males show this great big crest. The females do not have it. The crest, well, the crest is not important for swimming. And instead, what it does is it continues the display that they show on the back of their body, which is what we see in Spinosaurus, a big display on the back and a big display on the tail. So we think, although Spinosaurus was almost certainly a good swimmer compared to other carnivorous dinosaurs, it was not primarily a swimming hunter that it hunted by wading around in the shallows and striking at fish and turtles and so forth going by eating some land food as well, but that it could swim from spot to spot in its environment better than other carnivorous dinosaurs and did so in preference to striding over the land, which it wasn't particularly good at. There's also data from the isotopes in its teeth, and we'll talk about that in a later lecture, where we use how we use isotopes to try to restore the ecology. That suggests it was eating more water food than other theropods. Um, and so we think that wading and maybe some burst ambush swimming is more likely than something that was strictly an aquatic feeder. Okay, all the remaining theropods that we'll talk about in this course that I'll introduce are in a clade called avatheropoda. So avatheropods are within tetanurines, tetanurines are within avarostrans, avarostrans are within neotheropods, neotheropods are within theropods, theropods are within serischia, serischia is within dinosaurs. So avatheropods have two different clades, the carnosaurs, which I'll talk about in this lecture, and the celurosaurs, who we start to pick up on Friday. The cliche is carnosaurs are big predatory forms and celurosaurs are smaller ones, but as we'll see, the largest known carnivorous dinosaur is a celurosaur. So. In avatheropods, the name means bird theropod, manual digit four is lost. So we lost at the base of neotheropoda, or maybe it's theropoda, we lose digit four, oh, sorry, we lose digit five, so they only have four fingers. Now we lose manual digit four, so these are three-fingered animals from now on, or fewer. And the hollow chambers in the vertebrae are far more complex in avatheropods than in earlier theropods. We saw something similar. We noticed that the chambers in the vertebrae of macronarians were more complex than they were in earlier um, Oh, uh, macronarians and diplodocoids, uh, so neosauropods, were more complex than they were in earlier sauropodomorphs. So a similar pattern here in theropods. I do, however, want to throw out this recent idea, which is actually a really old traditional hypothesis, and that is that the megalosaurids and spinosaurids and so forth may be closer to the carnosaurs, the allosaur clade, than they are to celurosaurs or rather than the carnosaurs are to celurosaurs. So this has come out in a couple recent studies. Um, 
some earlier studies supported it, but the majority of analyses over the last uh, several decades have supported no, that Allosaurus and other Carnosaurs were closer to the Silurosaurus than they were to Megalosaurus and Spinosaurus and kin. So I'm not accepting this hypothesis yet as the better one, but I'm just like I like to do. I like to point out that some of the non-traditional ideas uh, have been supported in some studies, and maybe future studies will show that. Most of the support for linking the, carno the allosauroid carnosaurs with the groups that we normally consider as megalosaurids within a group called Carnosauria comes from the combination of traits in a newly discovered Jurassic form called as Asphaltovenator, which combines some megalosaur and allosaur or carnosaur elements in terms of its features. We'll see. So Carnosauria proper. Carnosauria is defined as Allosaurus and everything closer to Allosaurus than to modern birds. Um, and some people use Allosauroidea for this clade. Um, I'm one who considers Allosauroidea better used for a subclade within this. Um, but um, you'll see the, the name Allosauroidea out there. In any case, Allosaurus is the archetype of Carnosauria. We definitely anchor it on that. And these guys were the apex predators in Middle Jurassic China and some parts of the other world in the Middle, Middle Jurassic and globally from the Late Jurassic all the way through the early part of the Late Cretaceous. These were the apex predators around the world. So this is the longest run of dominance of any one theropod group. There are a variety of different clades within it. We're not going to talk about all of them. I, I talk about some of them on the lecture notes, but I just want to show you some of the variety. So here's a, a very early form, uh, Yangchuanosaurus, part of a group called the Metriacanthosaurs. Allosaurus itself is our best representative of the Allosauridae proper. It's known from dozens of good specimens. It's dominated the late Jurassic of Western North America, but it's also known from Europe. And so almost assuredly was here in Eastern North America. We just don't have good fossils from the Jurassic of Eastern North America. One clade within the Carnosaurs, and in fact, the most successful in terms of its range through time and the number of species known, is a group called Carcharodontosauridae. Carcharodontosaurids are giants. They show up in the early Cretaceous, and these are the latest surviving. They survived to the early part of the late Cretaceous, and they are essentially global. We have found them at essentially every environment uh, in which dinosaurs can be preserved in the Cretaceous, at least in the early parts of the Cretaceous. And they can be huge, 10 meters or more. Several of these are 5 tons or more. Some of these rival the largest tyrannosaurs and the largest spinosaurids as the biggest dinosaurs, or the, sorry, the biggest carnivorous dinosaurs. So there's Acrocanthosaurus, which was probably the biggest North American predator until Tyrannosaurus evolved tens of millions of years later. It's bigger than the majority of Tyrannosaurs. Acrocanthosaurus is a Carcharodontosaur known best from fossils from Oklahoma, but we have evidence of it further west. We also have evidence of it here in Prince George's County, Maryland. There are teeth of Acrocanthosaurus or something extremely closely related to it uh, that are found in Prince George's County. Here's Giganotosaurus, potentially the largest and most massive, or one of the largest and most massive uh, theropods. Um, it's got a cousin, Tyrannotitan, which looks a little more massive. And then, of course, Tyrannosaurus itself is probably more massive. All right, we can look at the theropods I covered in this part of this lecture and talk about some aspects of their feeding ecology and that's how we're going to wrap up this lecture. A typical theropod bite, oh I'm sorry this came out with a black background, it wasn't supposed to be, these are arrows here. A typical large theropod does not have what we call a secondary palate. So if you put your tongue behind your teeth further back and we have a solid palate and that's produced by flaps of bone coming from the, each of the maxillae meeting in the middle, or at least contacting the midline. A typical theropod is a, very similar to, say, a typical lizard in that it didn't have that. It didn't have a solid palate. Similarly, the nasals on the top of the snout of most theropods are unfused. And we will see a group a far superior group in my opinion, on Friday, where in fact there is a solid palate and there is fused nasals. And that aspect gives much 
great, much, great, much greater strength in twisting and turning. These guys couldn't bite down and twist and turn so much. The skull wouldn't be as strong in that. That said, compressive loading is great in these guys. They can slice down onto the prey pretty well. They couldn't slice down on it and twist and turn very strongly. So instead, forms like allosaurs, megalosaurids, and so forth, probably fed by vertical slicing and biting. Slicing down, pulling out meat. Slicing down, pulling out meat. And that goes with the shape of their teeth. These teeth are very lens-like, flat in cross-section. So blade-like, serrations up the front and down the back. And the root of a typical xiphodont tooth is only about the same length as the crown. So only a half the tooth length is, is above the tooth and half going down into, so half is above the gum, the other half goes down into the jaw. We will see forms where that changes um, later on. And that tooth is very good for slicing, but it's not so good for getting in there and twisting around. It would probably break. So bite and slice feeding was probably the major form of, of feeding in the theropods I covered in this part of the lecture, this lecture, with the exception of spinosaurids, and maybe to a degree the more solidly built skulls of abelisaurids. So um, these teeth are good for slicing down and pulling out chunks of meat, and it's worth remembering, like most dinosaurs, the lower teeth all fit within the tooth line of the upper jaw, so they have a wraparound overbite. Nevertheless, that's a serious form of biting and was certainly good enough to dispatch their prey. So here's a look at Allosaurus. Um, so feeding in some ways may be like a falcon, biting in there and pulling out chunks. Although, of course, an Allosaurus is a much bigger animal than a falcon. And if we think about the times in which these creatures lived, when the allosaurs and ceratosaurs, other than abelisaurids and so forth, were around, uh, the dominant groups of herbivores were, say, um, eusauropods. So those are some of their major prey. Or stegosaurs. Big animals which weren't particularly fast, and for which taking out chunks of their flesh is probably a good approach. You get enough slices out of it and pull them off, it's going to cripple the animal. As it gets weaker, you can go in for the killing bite. In the case of abelisaurids, they were up against titanosaurs. And we could see, for instance, the trackways that I should, from over here and that I talked about towards the beginning of the course show that an individual of Acrocanthosaurus was going after this huge macronarian. So they were willing to challenge quite large animals. So that's it for the early branches of theropods. Uh, make sure you watch this prior to seeing the next lecture, which we're going to take a look at tyrannosaurs and their kin. Take care.